Hello everyone and a warm welcome to an exciting synthesis video. Today we will learn some intriguing history on molecular propellers and organic chemistry as a whole and laugh at how chemists with inflated egos shaped some of the nomenclature that we use today. Towards the end we will dive into a total synthesis masterpiece and some reaction mechanisms. This last part will be a bit more advanced, but you will definitely enjoy the initial stories and chemistry even if you are a complete noob and not yet an organic synthesis wizard. Our journey starts with Taxol, a highly complex anti-cancer natural product that was first isolated from the endangered Pacific U in the 1960s. A decade later, researchers recognized its immense clinical potential when they discovered that Taxol could disrupt cell division. Over the 1990s, Taxol evolved to be one of the most essential drugs isolated from natural sources, hitting over $1.5 billion sales in 1999 as a chemotherapy drug. Taxol itself was a fiercely contested target, drawing the attention of over 30 academic research groups working on its total synthesis by 1992. Taxol syntheses have been reviewed extensively, for example in Casey Nicolaus' classics in total synthesis work. Instead of beating this to death, we will spend our time with another interesting thought. What happens if we up the ante, take the already colossal Taxol framework and introduce three random additional carbon-carbon bonds between centers? What might remind you of these houses that you drew without lifting your pencil when you were a small child is actually a legitimate molecule called Canatex propylene, first isolated from the needles of the Canadian U in 2007. Although it looks funny, Canatex propylene is no joke. This molecule really checks all the boxes characterizing structural complexity. There are two so-called propylene motifs. A literal dozen contiguous tertiary and quaternary stereocenters, only two non-neopental positions in the entire carbon framework, and some nice hydroxyl groups and a ketone to round things off. This has to be one of, if not the most complex natural product that has ever been isolated, excluding gigantic stuff like mitotoxin, because size alone doesn't always matter. This ridiculous complexity alone would justify the development of a synthetic route. This is coupled with the fact that, similar to its sibling Taxol, isolation from the Canadian U has extremely low yields and thus does not allow biological or pharmaceutical investigations in this potentially valuable compound. It could be, and to be honest this is highly likely, that Canatex propylene only looks funny and is actually medicinally useless. However, it could also be the key to a Taxol 2.0. Even if a fully chemical synthesis would not be viable for commercial production of a medicine, synthetic investigations are a prerequisite for structure activity relationship studies and could bring novel insights to our understanding of biochemistry, cellular biology and reaction methodology. Before we proceed, I wanted to take a brief moment to thank all of you for the mind-blowing support and interest for this channel. Our last video was received very positively. There also was some nice random YouTube algorithm action some time ago that really brought up the channel's visibility. I'm quite busy professionally, which is why making time for these videos is challenging, but I will stay committed to this channel and aim for more frequent uploads than just once in a blue moon. So, let's stop spinning our wheels and propellers. First, we will dive into some chemistry background before dissecting the total synthesis of Canatex propylene in detail. Because if you don't understand what a propylene is, you will embarrass yourself when you try to tell your friends at the bar about the amazing synthesis of Canatex propylene that you watched online. Propylanes are hydrocarbons that consist of three carbon rings that share a common carbon-carbon bond, also called a bridge, here always in red. They come in various flavors depending on the size of the carbon rings. In most cases, propylanes are highly strained, making them very reactive and unstable. Prior to the synthesis of the smallest 111 propylane in 1982 by Wilberg, there was much debate regarding whether or not such a 111 propylane could exist, let alone be successfully prepared and isolated. There has been significant research into propylanes, particularly around the character of their central bridge bond, which displays very diverse reactivity ranging from electrophilic, radical and nucleophilic pathways. Even though propylanes look too exotic and cute to be of any value, they are for example very useful for introducing yet another weird looking structure, the bicyclopentyl or BCP group under strain relief. 
A common way to do this are photo conditions and radical chemistry, but there are also nucleophilic or electrophilic alternatives. This PCP group is employed in drug discovery as a bioisosteer or a mimic for aryl rings, altering physical chemical characteristics that might be favorable for optimization of a medicinal lead compound. A prime example for this is this investigational drug from Pfizer that saw an improved potency and enhanced pharmacological profile upon substitution of the phenyl ring with a BCP group. Although rare, propylene structures occur in nature, but Canatex propylene is the only natural product that possesses two propylene units. Clearly, propylanes are not only nice to look at, but also provide a valuable playing field to learn more about physical chemistry, synthetic methodologies and drug design. Let us briefly go back in time to better understand some more history of propylanes and finally look at some chemical reactions. The first propylanes started to appear in the literature during the 1930s. These were the times of initial investigations into 4 plus 2 cycle additions, most notably the Diels Alder reaction, and the times where you had the pleasure to decipher nice molecular drawings such as this one. The first design synthesis of a propylene was executed much later in 1965, after three calmer decades, through a simple intramolecular Dickmann cyclization. Although it was the intent of the authors to synthesize and investigate propylene compounds, they did not give them a special name to characterize their unique appearance. During my reading, I discovered that the story around the actual propylene name is very funny. In Bloomfield and Ireland made the first 442 propylene in 1966. They tried to coin the name but very hilariously got rejected by the conservative journal editors. They formulated the name actually as Propellerane, but were forced to relegate their suggested nickname to only a footnote. Shortly thereafter, still in 1966, it was David Ginsburg who first got away by using the Propylane name and continued to pioneer a lot of the Propylane research. There is an account by Ginsburg that is very interesting and entertaining to read. He starts by saying that editors and others who reject the Propylane trivial name are annoying and stupid. It should be clear to us that using simplified names for molecules can sometimes be better than adhering to stringent and formal rules. I mean, imagine calling your professor buddy in the 1960s over phone and telling them, yo, I just made a nice tricyclo 1110113 pentane analog. And this is even the simplest case. Throughout the paper, Ginsburg also belabors that there was quite a hype around propylanes, even though they were being prepared since the 1930s. He boasts himself of being a great mate to Vladimir Prelog, who was one of the OG chemists who later received the Nobel Prize in 1975 for his work on stereochemistry. During one of his many visits to Zurich, Ginsberg got schooled by Prelog, who showed him some unpublished, similar or potentially identical research on propylanes that his team had already conducted in the 1950s, which was a nice flex. To cover some simple chemistry before looking at the modern total synthesis, we will briefly dive into the synthesis of 442 propylane by Bloomfield and Ireland. These were the guys who got their propylane name rejected, as I mentioned earlier. The original intent of their paper was to investigate whether bridged naphthalene derivatives would isomerize to their corresponding bridged cyclodecapentines through electrocyclization reactions. I think they expected this isomer, in which the olefin geometry looks very dubious. However, even Ginsburg shared in his account that they were investigating similar isomerization reactions. As he put it, the rings in propylanes might exhibit extraordinary interactions. The starting material for the synthesis was this known anhydride, which was prepared via a clever one-pot sequence of a first deals older reaction with one for butadiene and an alkyne dienophile, then an intramolecular condensation, and finally a second deals older reaction. This anhydride is not really a propylene because the free rings are not exclusively carbon-based. Their actual routes started with cleavage of the anhydride with methanol. In two steps, the free carboxylic acid was also converted to the methyl ester via chlorination. To form the propylene framework, they had to create the third carbon ring, which they accomplished through a reductive cyclization, affording this alpha hydroxy ketone. Stepwise reduction of the alcohol and the ketone removed the no longer necessary functional groups. With this intermediate in hand, they produced a saturated 442 propylene by simple hydrogenation. To answer their original question of isomerization, they also needed to make the tetraene derivative. They accomplished this through exhaustive bromination of the alkenes. 
followed by quadruple elimination proceeding in around 10 to 15 percent yield. When they then heated this product at around 150 degrees centigrade, no 6 pi electron electrocyclization to the strange looking cyclodecapentaene was observed. Instead, the team found formation of naphthalene under release of ethylene. This propylene synthesis was easy to understand as it employed chemical reactions you might have even learned in high school. However, it was also inefficient. We will contrast this more basic research with advanced organic chemistry by reviewing the total synthesis of Canatex propylene published by Professor Geich and co-workers in 2020. The target molecule did not get any simpler since we last looked at it, but you might already be proficient in recognizing the propylene motifs, one of which is actually also a 442 propylene. Let's start with the retrosynthesis, so identifying potential disconnections through synthetic intermediates to simple starting materials. The first step of the retrosynthesis, and thus the last step of the forward synthesis, was the construction of the 332 propylene by closure of the A ring via a pinnacle coupling. If we look at some of the taxol syntheses, for example by Nicolau and Mukayama, we see that the pinnacle coupling is often employed to form carbon rings via two carbonyl groups. The required starting material for the pinnacle coupling was traced back to this compound with a protected alcohol on one side that would be oxidized to the aldehyde and a less functionalized diene on the other side of the molecule. There are multiple transformations hidden in this step and we will explore them in detail when we talk about the forward synthesis. Much more important is the following realization. By going through this cyclohexadiene, the team elegantly enabled the disconnection of the cyclobutane core through an intramolecular de-aromative 2 plus 2 cycloaddition. 2 plus 2 photoadditions are one of the most commonly used and robust methods for cyclobutane synthesis. If we now redraw the required starting material in a simpler representation, we realize that we could access it through a Diels Alder cycloaddition of these two simpler building blocks. Let's look at the forward synthesis now, exploring the real life experiments the team performed. They initiated the synthesis by converting this lactone into the isobenzofurane and performed the Diels Alder reaction with this dienophile. The cycloaddition proceeded with high regioselectivity that can be rationalized through electronics as well as excellent diastereoselectivity, affording the endoisomer through favorable secondary orbital overlap between the carbonyl group and the diene. Getting the endoisomer is essential to enable the subsequent photoaddition, because the two olefins are only in close proximity in this configuration. In the exoadduct, the olefins would basically look at two opposite sides. The 2 plus 2 addition proceeded in around 50 yield with incomplete conversion of starting material, so the authors usually resubjected to re-isolated starting material to the photo conditions, bringing up the overall yield over three cycles to around 70%. In just two steps, the team already forged the 442 propylene, all four quaternary stereocenters of the cyclobutane and the de-aromatized B-ring. Based on this initial trajectory, you would think that they might complete the synthesis in just five more steps. But of course, things aren't always this straightforward. The next task was the construction of the carbon framework, which required opening of the lactol highlighted here. Despite extensive experimentation, the team only observed fragmentation of the skeleton after deprotection, delivering this keto-lactone. Sometimes unwanted reactions happen in synthesis, and it might make sense to just roll with the inherent reactivity of molecules. The team did exactly this and cleverly used the keto-lactone to open the bond that they were not able to break earlier through a highly stereoselective reduction with calcium borohydride, after which an intramolecular translactonization followed directly in situ. To avoid any interference during the subsequent functionalizations, they protect the alcohol with mom chloride. Next, they still had to solve for the original task, namely construction of the all-carbon-based framework of Canatex propylene. To this end, they reductively opened the lactone and oxidized both alcohols in the intermediate using Swern conditions. This ketoaldehyde then underwent an intramolecular aldol reaction, re-establishing the cage-like core, as well as putting the ketone and the secondary alcohol in place that are present in the target natural product. With most of the skeletons sorted out, the team turned their attention to the functionalization of the B-ring. If you remember, we skipped over these steps in the retrosynthesis. This required installation of another hydroxyl group and installation of the quaternary methylated stereocenter in the B-ring. 
This posed some serious challenges to the team and after many different approaches, they used a 4 plus 2 photo oxygenation with singlet oxygen to functionalize the diene. Due to steric shielding of the endophase by the adjacent C18 methyl group, this proceeded in high stereoselectivity. You can be absolutely sure that this was not the first reaction they opted for. Such singlet oxygen reactions can sometimes be a saving grace, but it can be tricky to get the right conditions to actually carry the peroxides further in the synthesis. Surprisingly, the endoperoxide proved to be very stable and the team tried various reduction conditions that were not successful or practical. Through serendipitous discovery, the team observed productive fragmentation in some conditions with tetrahydrofuran as a solvent, but only if that THF was from specific bottles. They assumed this could be due to varying contents of BHT, which is a phenol-based additive that prevents the formation of explosive peroxides in THF. When they purposefully added two equivalents of BHT and potassium acetate as a base, they obtained this product which resulted from reductive cleavage of the oxygen-oxygen bond. How could this happen? First, the phenol or phenolate in BHT nucleophilically cleaves the peroxide, affording this adduct. Now, the acetate base abstracts a terminal hydrogen at BHT's methyl group and initiates a reductive elimination of the BHT group. The BHT ketone that flies off was actually detected in the GCMS, which is probably why the researchers postulated this mechanism. After workup of the reaction mixture, the crude product was stirred with silica gel to hydrolyze the hemiacetal and afford the ketone. This fragmentation saved the synthetic route. However, the stereochemistry of the new hydroxyl group at C5 was off compared to the Canatex propylene configuration. So, the team performed a selective allylic oxidation with IBX, so this does not touch the other secondary alcohol. Another selective, directed reduction of the ketone with sodium triacetoxyborohydride assisted by the neighboring hydroxyl group at C20, established the correct serochemistry of the alcohol. To prevent any unwanted side reactions again, the team then protected both hydroxyl groups as the benzylidine acetal, and then they reduced the enone with L-selectride, because that double bond is not needed anymore. To further prepare the functionalization of the V-ring, they then converted the ketone into the vinyl triflate and performed a palladium-catalyzed carboxymethylation. This sequence now introduced a CC bond outside of the B-ring and also set the stage for the next reactions. They employed a dissolving metal reduction with magnesium to reduce the alpha-beta unsaturated ester and then performed a simple methylation that gave the desired diastereomer at the quaternary center. This exoselectivity could again be due to the shielding of the endophase due to the C18 methyl group as we've discussed for the singlet oxygen addition. This reaction fully establishes the V-ring. This means they only had to close the remaining 5-membered ring to wrap up the skeleton. They reduced the ester to the alcohol and deprotected the TBS ether that was chilling the whole time, giving this diol. A double swern oxidation gave the dialdehyde that was the starting material for the pinnacle coupling we mentioned in our retrosynthetic analysis. This cyclization proved quite challenging. The desired product was of course the 5-membered ring that stems from reduction of one of the aldehydes to the cattle radical anion and subsequent intramolecular cyclization. However, the team observed significant side reactions, such as radical fragmentation destroying the cyclobutane core, as well as double reduction without cyclization, essentially reversing the previous Swern oxidation. Gratifyingly, excess titanium chloride in zinc gave the 5 membered ring in 55% yield over two steps, and as a lucky bonus, as the desired trans isomer with correct absolute stereochemistry. To complete the synthesis, they only had to introduce the acetylation pattern in the natural product and remove the protecting groups. To do this, they exploited the inherent reactivity and sterics of the molecule. First, they performed a double acetylation of the pinnacle product and deprotected the mom group at C2. Now, selective mono deprotection of the acetate at C9 was possible under mild conditions, leaving the acetate at C10 intact. Then, they selectively acetylated the hydroxyl group at C2, which also favored this more reactive side instead of the C9 position. Finally, hydrogenation of the acetal released the monstrosity canatex propylene. As this synthesis was racemic, the researchers also wanted to establish an enantioselective synthesis to top things off. 
After investigating numerous literature reported and novel conditions, they found that by using a chiral silyl group as a Lewis acid, a modest diastereoselectivity selectivity of 1.5 to 1 could be achieved, of course still with the endoselectivity that we discussed initially. After separation of the diastereomers and removal of the silyl group, the team had some enantiopure intermediate in hand that they used to repeat the synthesis, this time in an enantioselective manner. I hope you enjoyed this crazy adventure over 26 steps. I think it builds nicely on the history we went through at the start, exemplifying the power of cycloadditions as they deployed a deals older reaction, a 2 plus 2 photo addition and a 4 plus 2 singlet oxygen addition. Geich and colleagues leveraged very elegant disconnections and clever approaches to overcome the challenges that this big boy threw at them. If you are still watching, you are a real MVP and probably also a fellow synthesis nerd. Please share a comment and a like on this video to show your support and let me know your thoughts. Until next time.